Great Barrier Reef Legacy launched its first research expedition in November 2017. Funded by the Northern Escape Collection and the offer of their vessel, by small business donations from far and wide, and by in-kind support from companies all over the globe, Great Barrier Reef Legacy was able to provide free access to a team of collaborating researchers from private and government research institutions and to continue to build networks and relationships with existing organisations as now, more than ever before, it was time to work together. With expert scientists arriving, the media soon followed and a team of volunteer crew from Great Barrier Reef Legacy joined the Flying Fish in Port Douglas to turn a luxury white boat into a dedicated research vessel. In support and solidarity, the multi-award winning Netflix documentary, Chasing Coral, sent their star, Zach Vago, to be part of the education and communication team. Together, they launched the largest privately funded collaborative research expedition the Great Barrier Reef had seen, with results communicated direct from the reef to the public through live television and radio interviews and daily interactive updates on social media channels with a combined reach of more than 5 million followers. And all of this was achieved by volunteers. Over the next 21 days, we're sending our research vessel and a team of expert marine scientists into the very remote, far northern Great Barrier Reef on an expedition to provide an overall reef health assessment and to search for the super corals. While the divers slipped beneath the waves, Dr Javier Leon took to the air. So basically what I'm doing is just getting this little drone to, to go to a reef flat and take overlapping photos. Uh, from that overlap, I can, I can build these amazing ortho mosaics. Um, we're getting two centimeters, which is just unreal. We can just zoom in so, so much that it's just amazing that the stuff we can see. Ideally, this is setting a baseline that we can come back and see because the, the detail that this is giving us um, will allow us to see things like major bleaching events, for example. So we can definitely see how wide or not the reef that is. Drone mapping for the first time tells us so much about the health of reefs on a grand scale. But it was up to Dr Monique Grohl and Dr Manuel Gonzalez Rivero to take the mapping and surveys underwater to understand bleaching at a much finer resolution. We take a camera and we, and we take uh, about an image every meter or every two meters and those images are referenced because we have a GPS on the top of the buoy. Then we manage to actually put them together so every single image has uh, information where we were, it was taken. On average we swim about three kilometers a day and we take about on average five to six thousand pictures during those three kilometers. We have maps for every single road forest part of the country, but there is not one map of the reef. Turtles have also shown changes in behavior with warmer water, and Dr. Ian Bell was on board to learn more about the far northern green turtle populations. So you can see how she's using her hind flippers, how dexterous she is to actually dig her egg chamber and then she's going to lay her eggs and you can see the eggs now um, popping out from uh, her overduck. And now that she's finished laying her eggs we're going to um, put this satellite tracker on her and, uh, and then uh, we're going to try and track her progress from here from the nesting beach through her migration pathways back to her feeding grounds. Over the course of the expedition, the teams visited a range of highly impacted reefs, devastated by the bleaching events. Among all this mortality, Dr Neil Canton and Great Barrier Reef Legacy interns identified the first known super coral species, Acropora tenuis, a tough branching coral Obvious signs of bleaching mortality within the lagoon, lots of dead coral. 
Um, but it took a long time to find enough that had eggs. But we've found six whole colonies here that have eggs that we're now going to try to understand if these eggs are viable. So these are survivors of the last two bleaching events, and we want to understand what these guys have that the others didn't. Uh, back to the ship, keep them on flowing water for the next few days before we try to fly them home. Uh, back to Townsville and the National Sea Simulator at Ames. Uh, where we're going to test if these corals from the far north that have survived the bleaching events can provide um, increased tolerance to future thermal stress and ocean warming and help us enhance reef restoration efforts into the future. Dr Emma Camp and Assistant Sam Goyen took the investigation to a completely different level, molecular and physiological. So on the dives, we are looking for our target coral species to see what their physiological traits are and also their genetic traits to try and understand how they've survived some of the worst bleaching events the Great Barrier Reef has seen. In the bathroom here, you can see our little makeshift lab. And what we've done is we've got two different coral species, but two that have been abundant so far on the transects we've got. And what we wanted to see is are there specific traits or properties of these corals that maybe have allowed them to survive the bleaching and do, and do better um, over the course of the stress that we've seen. But it's the outer reef sites that surprised the team. One particular site, though, revealed something very, very special. And the grandfather of coral, Dr. Charlie Verran, responsible for classifying and naming more than 20% of the world's corals, was stunned. Oh, it's an amazing place. <laughs> I've never seen this on the Great Barrier. Really? No, really. Never, ever? Never. Ever. Wow, what does that say to you? It says, boy, this, this place is not done yet, that's for sure. <laughs> oh my God. Well, that's good news, that's good news. Oh, it's just so Why is this one just so special, Charlie? Well, it's just, I've just never seen it before. It's just something completely new to me. And I've never seen anything like it. And there were, as far as I know, as anybody else. Was there lots of it down there? No, there wasn't. That was the only colony I saw. So what I'm holding here is a tray full of absolute discovery. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been in that tray as we in the before. Wow. Awesome. Well, this could be the most significant collection of corals. Uh, for the Great Barrier Reef in a very, very long time. As the team headed back to Port Douglas after this incredible journey, they began to compile preliminary results, images and videos to be made available for free in an open access database, the first of its kind. For it's not just collaboration on board that had taken place, as this information will continue to be shared with scientists, managers, innovators, educators, communicators, non-government organisations and the public worldwide. I can see it now, not, not even being a scientific person, the benefit of having these numbers or having this, this cross-representation of all the disciplines of that one science. Ships running.
things that I think are incredibly important. And uh, this trip has really provided uh, as the first of many handles on, on how we can get the reef through the coming decades. It's kind of gotten up and get um, this will be the strip of helping hang on to the the Great Barrier Reef Legacy Model is a long-term solution to improving reef health, education and innovation by providing the most cost-effective access to the reef for those who need it most. By acting as a platform and a catalyst that allows us to all work together, we can take immediate action and leave a legacy of hope and resilience for the next generation.